Hello and welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Melanie Tanilion, the director of the Center for Armenian Studies here at the University of Michigan. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all for, for this first session of our two-day workshop series titled From Empire to Nation State, the Ottoman Armistice, Imagined Borders and, Dis and Displaced People, organized by one of our post postdoctoral fellows, Ari Shakarian, in collaboration with our own Ronald Sunni. Before I begin, I would like to express my usual gratitude to our program specialist, Naira Tumanian, who uh, for working, of course, behind the scenes to put this together, um, as she always does diligently, and we would not be here without her. You may use your Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to the panelists and speakers at any time during our session, and we will collect those and address them towards the end of each of these uh, uh, panels. So on this very snowy and cold morning in Ann Arbor, I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Ronald Sunni. Ronald Sunni is the William H. Sewell Jr. Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Michigan and Emeritus Professor of Political Science and History at the University of Chicago. He also was the first holder of the Alex Manugian Chair in Modern Armenian History here at the University of Michigan, where he founded and directed the Armenian Studies Program for many years. He has authored a long list of books that span five dec decades of scholarly accomplishments from the Baku commune class and nationality in the Russian revolution that he published in 1972, the making of the Georgian nation looking towards Ararat, Armenia in modern history, the revenge of the past, nationalism, revolution, and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet experience, they Can Live in the Desert But Nowhere Else, A History of the Armenian Genocide, Red Flag Unfurled, History Historians and the Russian Revolution, and co-authored with Valerie Kivelson, uh, Russia's Empire Stalin's Passage to Revolution, To the Red Flag Wounded, Stalinism and the Fate of the Soviet Experiment, published last year. He's currently working on a book on the recent upsurge and exclusive exclusivist um, nationalism and authoritarian populism called Forging the Nation, the Making and Faking of Nationalism. And what speaks to his leadership in Armenian studies most poignantly is that in 2005, the Middle East Studies Association awarded Professor Sunni and his co-organizer, Professor Fatma Mugegocek of the University of Michigan, its Academic Freedom Prize for their work in bringing Armenian and Turkish scholars together to further the study of the Armenian genocide. With that, I welcome Ron to the virtual floor. He's already here to give opening remarks and also to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Melanie. This is a great honor for me and a real great pleasure because already having read some of the papers and uh, engaged with Ari Shakerian through this semester, I'm really anxious to learn more about this interesting topic. So this is a workshop. That is, it's a work in progress shop. In the, indeed, what we're trying to do is uh, listen to these papers, read these papers, and, and, and make them even better. Uh, and the topic itself, from empire to nation state, this odd period of the Ottoman armistice is appropriately inspired by and was, as Melanie mentioned, primarily organized by this year's Manukin postgraduate fellow, someone I already consider a friend and I've known him for a while, Adi Shakirian. There's hardly a more intimate connection between a subject and a scholar than Adi has with the theme of this conference. He's one of the few scholars who's been dealing with the immediate post-genocide period in the history of the Armenians of Turkey. And he himself grew up in Istanbul. He's an Istanbulu Armenian studying, of course, in Turkish and in Armenian. And then he went off to England and received his PhD from Oxford University and wrote a dissertation, which will soon be a book, writing on the shifting fortunes 
and perspectives of Armenians from the last Ottoman year through the occupation into the uh, Kemalist Republic. So this is a period of enormous and fraught transitions. Uh, and we've brought together a new generation of scholars whose work helps to illuminate this odd and often forgotten period. Now, some of our own former uh, Manukian postdocs like Lerne Ekmekciol who have worked on this period uh, and this uh, and Ari's work and Lerna's work and, and the others who have looked at this, some of our own participants is enriching, not only enriching, but opening up uh, what was a darker spot in the history uh, of the Armenians. The papers range from a recovery of the unknown story of Armenian victims of an Italian bombardment of the Greek island of Corfu in 1923. We'll hear about that this afternoon. To various imaginaries of homeland, Yerkir among Armenians, among Soviet Armenians, to the works of painters who depicted complex and contradictory images of the armistice period. Now, let me just set the scene a little bit. The genocide of the Armenians from 1915 through 1916 can be said, arbitrarily, I suppose, to have ended by late January 1917. Mass starvation continued as well as sporadic killings, but the refugees uh, who continued to die and fighting continued between Armenians, Turks, and Kurds going on into the early 1920s, that's all right. And sometimes some historians have said that's a continuation of the genocide, but I would say that the intentional mass killing, the massacres, uh, and the forced starvation of Armenians and Assyrians by the Ottoman state gradually was coming to an end. And on January 22nd, Talat himself, the architect of the genocide, who had then been uh, elevated to Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire, uh, already was thinking about order and, and did order the Greeks of Samson, Samson to be deported to the interior of Anter An Anatolia. So the process was going on, but now in a slightly different way. In a ferocious speech, Justifying the removal of the Armenians, Talat once again stated the central argument for the deportations while denying any intention to physically annihilate the Armenians. Quote, every government has the right to defend itself against those who stage armed revolts, unquote. After all, he went on, weapons and explosives have been found all over Anatolia, primarily hidden in monasteries and churches false claims. Even as it curtailed its comprehensive destruction of its Armenian subjects, the Ottoman government was seeking to justify what it had done in a campaign of denial that would flourish for the next century, produced its first documentary collection in 1917, it was entitled The Revolutionary Targets and Machinations of the Armenian Committees Before and After the Constitution. So this is a frame this collection, the documents, the views of the leaders in which the armistice is going to explode. When Talat, a few years later, after he fled Istanbul, turned to his own accounting of the genocide in his memoirs, largely a work of fiction, I would say, and which was then posthumously published, he acknowledged that the deportations, which he saw as an obligation, a requirement to secure the safety of the army and its citizens, he acknowledged it had been accompanied by excesses. He confessed that the government should have done more to prevent atrocities. Instead, the government had simply given in to Turkish elements, that's what he called them, who were short-sighted, I'm quoting, fanatical and yet sincere in their belief. And the public encouraged them and they had general approval behind them, unquote. Now, while the Ottoman authorities were shifting responsibility from the government to ordinary people and blamed the Armenians for their own destruction, this view of the genocide in these post-war years, in fact, was shared in a variety of ways by foreigners as well. It was still a powerful image by the Germans uh, in, in certain British uh, um, publications and so forth. I'm going to mention just one. The German consul in Trabizon wrote the following, anyone who knows the Orient will agree with me that the Armenians are blessed with hardly a trait that humans find attractive. 
Despite this, the excesses that took place during the deportation, mass murders of the men, numerous rapes of women and children, and theft of their possessions cannot be condemned severely enough. The Turkish government was at least not unhappy about the attacks against the Armenians that led to their almost complete annihilation in East Anatolia and still holds this opinion today." Unquote. Well, by October 1918, it was clear that, that uh, the Ottoman Empire had lost the war, that it had to surrender, and Talat and his cabinet were compelled to resign on October 8, 1918, and a new Ottoman government decreed that Armenians were now permitted to return to their homes. On October 30th, the Mudras armistice was signed and the Ottomans withdrew from the war. The mood in Istanbul was one of relief that the devastating war was over. The war had not been popular and the losses had been colossal for all peoples. Armenians and Greeks, of course, were ecstatic that the allies were triumphant and they were coming to the city. Within two weeks, World War I ended with the defeat of the Central Powers and British, French, and Italian troops occupied Istanbul. And they would stay there for almost five years until late September, 1923. Suddenly the world changed for Turks, Germans, and Armenians. The Armenians were seen now as allies of the, ally, of the allies of the allies. And they were treated as beneficiaries of their victory. So this is where we enter the picture, where this workshop begins. Our period, the years of the armistice begin, and the story of these years stretches far from Istanbul, from historic Armenia, from Eastern Anatolia, to a street in Charlottenburg in Berlin, to Tiflis in the Caucasus. We have the honor and the pleasure and the privilege today to hear as our keynote speaker, Ryan Gingaris, a professor at the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School. Ryan has the privilege of living in one of the most beautiful places in the world, far from Ann Arbor and Monterey, California. And whenever he's not sunbathing or just gazing at the ocean, Ryan thinks, reads, and writes about some of the most horrendous moments in the history of the Ottoman Empire, modern Turkey, the Balkans, and the Middle East. I consider Ryan a historian in the best sense of the word. He's honest, he's fearless, and he's ready to look straight at and open up the black holes of the past. He's already the author of four books, including most recently, Fall of the Sultanate, The Great War, and The End of the Ottoman Empire, 1908-1922. His amazing, sorrowful shores, violence, ethnicity, and the end of the Ottoman Empire received prizes and was noted on the short list for the Rothschild Book Prize in Nationalism and Ethnic Studies, and the British Kuwait Friendship Society Book Prize. He's published in a large variety of places, some more journalistic and, and uh, 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 programmatic articles in Foreign Affairs, International Journal of Middle East Studies, Middle East Journal, Iranian Studies, Diplomatic History, Past and Present, no easy thing, Journal of Tempor Contemporary European History. And as a faculty member of the Naval Postgraduate School, He's participated and contributed to research and executive education projects on behalf of the Department of State, Department of Energy, and Department of Defense. In addition to speaking German, Spanish, and fluent Turkish, reading Ottoman, of course, he also possesses working knowledge of Albanian and Macedonian. And after this conference, I'm confident he will begin working on his Armenian. This morning, Ryan Gingras opens our conference with his keynote address, Making Sense of the End, Thoughts on Writing a History of the Armistice Period. Ryan. Thank you so much, Ron. I, um, it was a really kind opening. And I, I have to say it is probably a bombing, balmy 45 degrees right now outside my window. Uh, it's sunny, but you know, I wouldn't sunbathe 
uh, at least uh, this morning. Uh, anyway, I, let me first um, really express my heartfelt gratitude to you, Ron, to Melanie, to Ari for this uh, invitation today and, and this honor to um, be able to begin this, this conference. I, I'm, I've been really looking forward to it. I'm really sorry we, we can't all be together to share this, um, um, this, this morning together, um, but uh, I know um, we're in for um, really wonderful discussions, wonderful papers. Um, let me begin, let me share my screen uh, and begin by uh, talking today about um, my current book project. And the reason why I've chosen to talk about this today was I, I thought it would serve at least as a, a springboard into a more general discussion this morning about the, um, the, the, the writing of history of this period. Okay, um, I, I, as, as Ron noted, I'm, I don't consider myself a, a scholar of Armenian history, uh, although I've, uh, I have great affection for that history and have written quite a bit about Armenians um, within the context of much broader works. And so what I thought I could do this morning, maybe the best way I could serve this group as somebody who's perhaps not um, you know, versed in Armenian language sources, not totally grounded within the broader studies of Armenian history, um, is to step back and look at the writing of the armistice period, the years between 1918 and, and 1922-23. And talk a little bit really about the, the process of writing this history. You know, what I intend to do here is not to delve into a kind of narrative of this period of time, but rather talk about some of the issues that confront someone who attempts to write a broader history of this period, what its significance is, um, as well as sort of the pitfalls that come, come with it. Now, uh, let me start off by talking about sort of where I am now in, uh, in life. So about a year and a half ago, uh, I got a surprise email out of the blue uh, from an editor asking if I would like to write a trade history of this period. Okay, so a history for a much more general audience. Now, I, I've written about the armistice period in the context of lots of different works, but usually as a sort of subset of that work. Um, you know, the, the early, you know, my, my first book certainly was grounded in this history, but it was a much more finite look into a particular place and a particular set of people between the years of 1918 to, to 1922. Um, so I was very excited by this. And, you know, one thing that really, um, was interesting and I think worth sharing in you know the initial sort of stages of this project was the very first conversation I had about this project with uh, my editor and you know and it was it was he I have to say who basically kind of pitched me this idea of doing a very specific history on uh, of 1918 to, to 1922. And so these were some of the things that, you know, he said to me why he thought it was a good idea. And, and I say this, I, I present this to you as a way of, you know, sort of saying what a person who is not personally invested, say, in the history of Armenians, not even necessarily personally invested in the history of the Ottoman Empire, but rather somebody who is in the business of selling books, who is familiar with uh, what it means to publish books on this period. He was somebody who has published several important books on the history of uh, the early 20th century, more specifically the First World War. And so what he said to me was, you know, I think this is a good idea for a book um, because number one, the centennial is coming up. The end of the Ottoman Empire um, will, you know, uh, will be celebrating its uh, 100th birthday uh, next year um, in 2022. And so he thought, you know, this is a good enough excuse to have a book like this. But more than that, you know, that over the last several years, um, there has been a real boom in studies of the First World War. And they've been popular. They've sold. People have been interested in books about the First World War. And then he went on to talk about how, you know, 
obviously it's a good idea too, because I mean, we get into broader issues, you know, that are really quite crucial to the understanding of politics and society in our time. Um, issues that are really quite critical to the making of the 20th century. The um, end of empires, the rise of nation states, and in particular, sort of during this very specific period of time in 1918 to 1922, um, the fact that you know European empires um, were you know enjoying something of a high watermark of of influence. On the one hand, you know in 1918 we see Britain and France emerge as the victors; their empires grow as a result. Uh, of their victory in the First World War. But one thing that this period of time emphasizes, not simply in the case of the Ottoman Empire, but in other places around the world, is that there were very real limits to which European, inf European imperial influence um, could stretch. And that, all, that it was becoming clear, increasingly clear that Britain and France in particular um, faced real challenges to maintaining their empires uh, as they were constituted. We begin to see really the very first whittling away of these empires, um, the very first sort of inklings of a, a broader process of decolonization. But it's this last point that really got me. Um, and I thought that, you know, really sort of captured my imagination. And he said, you know, when you write about a, the Ottoman Empire, or if you write about specifically sort of the makings of, uh, the, let's say the modern Middle East, um, this period of time comes at the end of a real slog in history. And you know, we, you know, if you anybody who's familiar with uh, late Ottoman history, and I know lots of you in the audience are, you know, it is one war after another, one tragedy after another. It is a, an incredibly trying period. Not simply for the people who live this history, but for the reader. You know, you have to end up plowing through the First World War and all of its tragedies to finally get to 1918. And as he put it, you know, the reader is really exhausted by the time you get to this period of time that you are ready for a transition to talk about something else, right? Specifically, the founding of the post 1918 world of nation states in the Middle East uh, that we know today. And so he thought it was you know, a good idea to really focus on this period, have a book about this period that acknowledges this long prologue, but really focuses on the tribulations, the, 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 the broader sort of existential questions that define this era of time. Now, needless to say, Armenians are a big part of this story. And this is something that we had talked about, but it's also one of many different you know, tro you know, sort of subplots that define this era of time. So uh, this was my marching orders, right? These were my marching orders to, to try to craft a book like this. And so needless to say, I was ecstatic. I mean, this is, you know, I live to write. Um, and so I, I immediately got to work. And among the first things that, you know, I, you know, thought about was to think about how I was going to do it in terms of what materials I would use because I had a, I have a relatively tight sort of timeline to write this book. I have got to get it done by by next year, but you know I'm, I'm looking good. I'm I'm on good. I'm, I'm I'm maintaining a good pace. So what I had to do was make use of materials that I could have on hand or I could get you know sort of have access to relatively easily. And I have to say that you know one thing that I, I was really kind of grateful for was that you know not only had I long developed a broader interest in this period, but that there are a tremendous number of resources to draw upon for this era of time. Now, for those of you who have not sat through um, conferences on Ottoman history before, specifically, you know, his, you know conferences that are framed uh, as sort of surveys or sort of you know, sort of general discussions of the empire from beginning to end, so from the 1300s to, you know, the early 20th century, um, you appreciate the fact that there's large chunks of it in which there are very few resources to draw upon. In fact, there's very little known about these, these periods of time, very little known about the characters or about the sort of regional conditions within the empire during this period of time. We have the absolute opposite problem for this era. 
that there are there is an incredible number of resources to draw upon. You know, if you go to WorldCat now, not asking that you do, you have to do it, although you're at your computers. Uh, you know, in, if you know you you look on WorldCat, WorldCat records some 3,500 books that are organized under the title History of the Turkish Revolution. So as this kind of a search, kind of general subject title. Okay, so that's a lot of work. And about 3,000 of these works are in Turkish. And so what this, you know, really obviously tells you that this is a really critical, you know, period, especially for people living in Turkey today, people who are scholars of Turkey. And I'm in really great shape because this is a language I can, I, I can work with. Now, beyond that, I mean, there's, one has to realize there's also a tremendous amount of international resources to draw upon. Um, in 1918, there was a, an incredible amount of international attention that was transfixed on the Ottoman Empire. And Armenians formed a really important element in driving this attention. So as a result of this, you know, anybody who engages in this period can go to any number of different archives. And you know, as I, as I state here in the slide, there are you know, a number of archives that have not been explored. I mean, the Italian archive, for example, I've never seen anything uh, utilizing the Italian archive to, to talk about the history of this period, even though Italy occupied uh, portions of Anatolia um, after 1918. Um, there are many that have been relatively underutilized and we're getting more and more materials of, you know, that um, is coming out of it that's forming the basis of various studies. Um, and there are even those you know, resources and the one that really comes to mind is the National Archive in London, which has been used for generations as a resource to tell the story of this time. And as somebody who's, I think knows this, this archive really well, I think we've not really tapped out all that we can find within it. There's a tremendous amount there. Then there's the issue of the press. And I'm not talking about specifically the, the international press, let's also talk about the local press. Um, there is a real abundance of newspapers that are produced during this period of time um, with really fascinating portrayals and insights into day-to-day -day life, opinions, um, just sort of the general uh, climate of this period. Um, the vast majority of them are in Ottoman Turkish, but there are also those that are in Armenian, there are those in Greek, there are those in German, there are those in English, and they also come from various perspectives. So, I mean, you're really not hurting for, for um, perspective during this period of time. And last but not least, I mean, uh, as, you know, Ron, you know, kind of kicked us off with, um, we now in 2021, I think, have a perspective on the First World War, um, which is as rich as, you know, one, you know, could have ever have imagined it to be uh, a few years ago. Um, you know, we are really the beneficiaries of a of a really wonderful number, really, you know, ever growing number uh, of scholars and scholarly works that have really begun to challenge our basic perspective of the First World War and the Ottoman Empire's participation in this First World War. So we have a lot going for us, in other words, for those of us who are interested in this period of time. Now, I have to say, though, you know, as somebody who's, you know, who is tasked with trying to bring this history to a broader public. There are topics, there are aspects of writing about this history that are kind of tricky, that are just sort of tricky in their, in, in, in their nature, okay? Now, among the most difficult aspects of it is that it's a tremendously dense period of time. Even if you're just talking about the Ottoman Empire, even if you're just talking about Armenians within the Ottoman Empire, um, between 1918 and 1922, 1922, a lot happens. A lot happens that um, are, you know, are, you know, that comprise events that are really complex. That have multiple actors um, that 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 invoke different types of controversies or issues that predate the armistice period. And so, you know, one is really challenged to try to balance all these different contextual issues while still being brief. I, you know, as again, as somebody who's trying to write about this 
for a larger audience, the object here is not to write a multi-volume tome, but rather something that hopefully uh, is, they could read comfortably, person could read comfortably, maybe not on the beach or on the subway, but, you know, comfortably enough. Anyway, so, you know, that's sort of the first real issue. And the other really kind of tricky issue is, you know, what are we talking about during this period of time in terms of the Ottoman state? Now, you know, colloquially speaking, or sort of with, you know, everyday, you know, parlance, we, you know, we often talk about the year 1918 as the year the Ottoman Empire ends, right? The First World War brings about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. And that's technically not true. Um, the Ottoman Empire, actually quite interestingly, survives the first, the end of the First World War, unlike, say, the Austria, the uh, Austria-Hungary, unlike, obviously, uh, Imperial Russia, unlike Imperial Germany, there are, you know, all three of these states are wracked by revolution that lead to the overthrow of the imperial dynasties. This does not happen in the Ottoman Empire. In fact, the dynasty continues, it endures um, past, you know, well past the armistice until there is the final piece of, um, uh, of 1923, in which we still have some remnant of that imperial dynasty and still not necessarily international recognition that the Ottoman Empire has indeed fallen. In fact, between 1918 and 1924, oh, one could say that there are, you know, that there are different stages in which the empire is collapsing or has begun to collapse. And it's, this may sound like a technical point, but it makes it difficult in a very practical sense of talking about what the country it is that you are talking about in your book. Is it the Ottoman Empire or are we talking about this new state that comes into being the state of Turkey? And even there it gets a little tricky too, because it's clear that for the perspective of many people who lived through this period, the state that is defeated in 1918 endures past the armistice into the 1920s, but sort of has a name change, has a regime change in the bit in the midst of it. So again, kind of a technical legal point. In other words, there is still a state. It goes from being an Ottoman state to a Turkish state, but the state endures. So it leads to kind of this broader intellectual question of what actually falls. What is the what, what's the thing that's doing the falling during this period of time between 1918 and 1922? So all of a sudden done, it, it for the, if you were to assume the perspective of the lay reader, it, it is confusing. What is the thing that happens during this period of time? What in fact happens to the Ottoman Empire? Now this other issue of inconsistency also extends to sort of the terminology of this time. You know, what do we call the state? Is it the, you know, what point does the Ottoman Empire cease to be the Ottoman Empire and become Turkey? Again, it's not, you know, it's not a clear cut issue. Even more complex is what do you call the people who presumably compose the nation that forms the basis of the nation state of Turkey. Now, what one reads throughout this period of time is references to um, people who are referred to as Turks, people who are referred to as Ottoman Turks, people who are referred to as Turks and Muslims, or people who are referred to as just Muslims. Now, uh, for those of you who are familiar with writing about this period, this is, a, this is very much representative of the incoherence or the still sort of the, the nebulousness of what identity meant within this remainder of the Ottoman Empire at the time of the armistice, that the idea, the notion of being Turkish was still a concept that was being worked through. And that while some had a rather tight and very bounded idea of what Turkishness meant. Many people, perhaps the majority of people living in this period of time, being Turkish is still somewhat of a kind of an open-ended, rather fuzzy concept. Now, again, uh, talking about this specifically from the practical side of things in terms of actually producing history about this, it, it leads to a little bit of, let's just say verbal gymnastics. You kind of have to work around the idea that the terminology, is not precise and that this imprecision 
or reflects still a kind of imprecise thinking about identity. And I think this is a, a much broader universal challenge in writing about this period for the wider Middle East. Okay. Now, there are other challenges I would emphasize too. And these are, you know, are challenges that are both um, purely academic and some of them are in a very specific subset to it as really uh, kind of speaks to, I think a broader challenge of writing history. Now the academic side of it, you know, one has to consider that um, this is obviously a, a period that is rife with controversy. Okay, uh, and I'm sure uh, this is a point that doesn't need to be hammered home for most of you. There are lots of points, both big points and smaller points, that are subject to dispute. Disputes as relatively trivial as to population statistics within a given district, those population statistics being the basis of perhaps inclusion or exclusion from a given state, to much broader issues such as, you know, the challenge of genocide or the, the sort of the charge of genocide against the Ottoman government. And it's and the issue of genocide um, within Turkish society today. Now, I, I obviously, again, I, I'm sure all of you who are you know, on the call today uh, are well familiar with the fundamentally you know, heated nature of, the, uh, of, of debates over these issues. But there's another element too, which is linked to these academic challenges, which I think is sort of much more rooted in the, the challenge of writing history. And that is something I would kind of generally call the, the tyranny of received narratives or the, the, the tyranny of, of, you know, commonly held perceptions of the narrative arcs of the past. Now, let me explain this, what I mean by this um, as quickly as I can. You know, um, if you read enough histories of this period, I, I, I tend to see it as, you know, the history is being defined by two basic tendencies in terms of editorial sensibility, okay? On the one hand, you could say that a large numbers of books are defined by the, you know, sort of the general story of unredeemed nations or nations that had been you know sort of had been betrayed sort of uh, you know gravely injured nearly des destroyed perhaps but most importantly betrayed and we can sort of put in this category the history of armenians during this period of time we could put in this category the history of kurds the greeks Arabs as well, all of these peoples who had been part of the Ottoman Empire, if we were to sort of talk about the narrative arc of these peoples within this frame, you know, this time frame, we are talking about a, um, you know, a story in which we have at the beginning in, you know, 1918, um, peoples who are emerging out of great tragedy, Nation, peoples who had actually had suffered to the point uh, of near extinction, in, you know, in, in various cases. But in 1918, the potential promise of independence, the potential promise, pro, you know, promise of uh, of self governance, of being able to establish themselves in as nations in homes of their own. However, by 1922, that promises. Uh, it doesn't simply fail, it is betrayed. And it is betrayed by a number of different actors, most prominently by the West, that the West, is, you know, a, as the sort of the, the, the purveyor of this promise, particularly the, the allies who uh, organize the, the, the Treaty of, uh, of Paris and who promote the idea of self-determination, that uh, concept is, is either withdrawn, it is forgotten, or it is, um, or is or is only sort of fulfilled in part. Okay, so this is, you know, the, the, this is a period in which, if you were to write about Armenians or Greeks or Kurds or Arabs, it is hard to get away from this trope. Okay, this trope of betrayal. Now, on the flip side of that, there are a, an incredible slew of books in which this period is. A fundamentally portrayed as a kind of like Arthurian story, sort of a hero story, in which like, you know, 
uh, England in the time of King Ar Arthur, we are introduced to a place in 1918, the Ottoman Empire, that is uh, at this you know low ebb in its history. You know, it's this this time of uh, of of danger and um, violence and chaos. And from this moment comes a hero, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He emerges and he single-handedly redeems the nation and state um, that he eventually claims leadership over. Um, and it, this, the evocativeness of this tale is so powerful. It pervades many works not simply those that are produced in Turkey, but those who are produced by scholars, by journalists, by uh, contemporary observers, um, who uh, find this the, the character of Mustafa Kemal, the story that he seems to uh, embody um, or sort of or or engender uh, inspiring uh, and, and fascinating. Now, I mean, this is so we have also in this. In, in other words, this challenge of writing a story that, uh, or trying to produce a history of this period that, you know, somehow has to straddle these two narratives that most readers are familiar with. And I would say, you know, I've, I've actually, I'm, I'm gonna tell a secret to everybody. I haven't talked about this with the editor yet. I'm hoping this will be okay. But, you know, I think that the, the power of these two historical tropes, which are really at loggerheads, with one another, these two approaches to this period, are, which are so at odds with one another, um, it it makes it puts the reader in some ways in a very difficult position because you're there for those who are most likely to read it, they are familiar with the basic outlines of this period. They're familiar with the basic historical arc of this period, either as this period of betrayal or as this sort of Arthurian um, sort of this kind of Arthurian tale in modern day, and. Uh, trying to sort of split the difference or sort of come out with some sort of third arc um, runs counter to a lot of readers' expectations. And it, it may it potentially frighten off a lot of editors as well. So here we kind of are stepping somewhat, or me, not me, you, me, really, sort of stepping um, into a somewhat dangerous territory in trying to produce a history, it, it, you know, from my perspective, um, that is really neither of these things, because I think ultimately these this sort of um, arc that we often, or this sort of this narrative trope that we often project on this period of time, absolutely obscures far more than it reveals, be it in the case of the of betrayal or as a as a hero story. Okay, so what I've tried to do, or at least I'm trying to do, is tell a broader story in the case of the end of the Ottoman Empire. And, and I think, you know, uh, we're really fortunate here today that we have people who are already beginning to do this in their own work, in that the Ottoman Empire and its fall between, its very slow fall between 1918 and 1922 is really a global one. And it's, the, it's a genuinely global one. It is, a, it is an event that impacts people in and beyond the borders of an empire that uh, is beginning to recede and perhaps collapse altogether. And that it is one that is really neither a kind of hero story, because when we look very closely at the, the story of Mustafa Kemal during this period, we see that we are confronted by a great deal more myth than, than reality, but also that in terms of even the actors who are at times, who are most often at times victims, they can be victimizers as well. And so, you know, when we look at this story in the broader lens, we see a story which, you know, from, again, my perspective, and I think, you know, this is something we're going to hear more about today, we see this period of time as a real important moment of catharsis, in which within this very compressed high stakes moment in history in which there was the real possibility of lots of different political fates up in the air, potential new states, the resurgence of this old state that had been around for centuries, the Ottoman Empire. People are gripped with the intense struggle 
to define who they were as nations, define the borders in which they live, and promote and, and to present themselves within this broader moment of reordering on the global stage in which the global, the global map is being redrawn and peoples, nations are fighting for recognition, independence or inclusion within various states and nations. Okay, so I'm, I, this is what I hope is sort of my anecdote to, my, my, my antidote, antidote to this, this broader challenge of, of the tyranny of past narratives. Now, sort of looking forward, you know, and sort of looking at the, the you know, the, the, the writing of this book, even though we, I, the, I'm, you know, we're all blessed to have so much to work with in terms of resources. And the, also sort of, we are genuinely standing on the shoulders of lots of people who have, have written about this period and done so quite ably. This is a, um, there are still many gaps to be filled. There are many issues that I think haven't been addressed or been addressed um, you know, in, in an incomplete way. And we can look at it in terms of different regions, for example. I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually quite fascinated by the fact um, you know, Ron, you know, during his opening remarks, uh, referenced the deportations of Ottoman Greeks from the region of Samsun on the, on the Black Sea. And those of you who are familiar with this period of time, especially, you know, sort of from the perspective of kind of the received Turkish narrative, kind of national narrative of, uh, of this era, specifically, the, you know, the, the national movement and the rise of Mustafa Kemal, um, the Black Sea is often considered an important front in the struggle to establish an independent Turkey. But genuinely, what we understand about this period um, is still resides a lot on uh, the um, histories written from government officials by state functionaries that doesn't necessarily reflect the richness of resources that are available to us. Um, the same could be said about what this period means for places like, you know, portions of Eastern Anatolia, um, Northern Iraq, specifically in the area, area of Mosul, which was still nominally part of the Ottoman Empire until, uh, you know, not genuinely resolved until 1926, but, you know, is still very much claimed as a part of what was the Ottoman Empire and even what became the Republic of Turkey. And in terms of sort of thinking about this period of time in terms of its, you know, its, its relevance and its really interconnectivity with struggles in and beyond the borders of the Ottoman Empire, you know, there are other places that could deserve a great deal amount of attention to. And I think this is a case where Armenian studies, you know, um, has its work cut out for it. I mean, there have been certainly studies about um, the establishment of um, the uh, Armenian Republic the struggles to specifically establish the borders of the Armenian Republic vis-a-vis -vis things like, you know, the areas such as the Karabakh or Nakhchivan. Um, but we've yet to really sort of look at this from the perspective of the ways in which the struggle actually was connected to the broader fight to preserve the independence of the Ottoman Empire. Um, the same could be the said for the degree to which that struggle also spilled over into Northern Iran, that, that Iran was actually quite fraught with conflict, conflict that was propagated um, by uh, Ottoman forces, and then even post-1918 by Armenian forces as well. And I think that this is, you know, again, you know, it's a, it, it, it reflects the fact that the end of the Ottoman Empire isn't simply relative, you know, relevant to Turks. It's not simply, uh, you know, something to be marked on the calendar as something that happened, but rather as part of a broader transnational event. Now, looking that much closer, and again, I'm sort of thinking specifically about how the, the future historians could better serve this period and better serve, I think, understandings of Armenians in this period. I think we have to have a lot a much closer look to at, at, at individuals who are either anti-nationalists, that is specifically people who are opponents of Mustafa Kemal, but more broadly, sort of conservatives uh, in the capital and in society, people who still see, you know, who still savored some sense of being Ottoman, some desire to preserve the Ottoman Empire in some way as it was constituted before the First World War. 
And we have a, a lot of resources to be able to tell the story. But so far, we've only kind of gotten these, you know, impressions of this, 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 this group of people um, episodically. And there's still, it remains a, a real taboo within uh, specifically Turkish society today, since they're often associated with Islamists, but more pointedly with opponents of, of Kemalism. And there are other issues I could sort of talk about too, you know, as being you know, relevant, certainly deserving of future studies. Um, one that I would sort of end with here is, you know, with respect to Armenians is that, you know, we, um, you know, I think that individuals like Ari are, are, you know, really blazing an important path in trying to understand um, this period of time, not simply as the aftermath of, of the Armenian genocide, but also in, in terms of continuity. And you know, this is also a period in which, you know, Armenia affairs is not stricken solely to the his so-called historic lands of Armenia, but to places which fell well outside the borders of Cilicia or outside of the Republic of Armenia or with even in the capital of Istanbul. You know, if you take, for example, places such as uh, Bartasag or uh, Bakchijik, just, you know, to the east of, um, uh, of the capital of Istanbul, you had a thriving Armenian community that is quite old, you know, a couple of centuries old, quite global in its character, um, but is faced with a real challenge of not only being a community comprised of Armenians, but a community comprised of Armenians outside the historic borders of Armenia and therefore outside the potential borders of an Armenian state. And so I think here, you know, with this last example, we see that there is a great deal of opportunity yet to be had in writing about this period, not only for scholars, but for a broader audience, since this is a moment that created a global community of Armenians that I think deserve uh, a, <coughs> sorry, you know, deserve a history that reflects their, their totality. So with that, I'm gonna take a drink, drink of water and I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ryan. That was brilliant and really useful. Uh, essentially, what I heard you do was frame the larger issues, problems, lap, uh, ellipses, and other missing part, <laughs> as well as what we know. And I particularly was taken by your idea of the tyranny of received narratives. It seems to me that that's what historians ought to be doing, is in fact confronting these tyrannies, this tyranny of received narratives, that is the existing present day common sense in the public, you're writing a book for a larger audience, uh, or in the profession, among professional historians, uh, the way we've been telling the story and the way we, we need to retell the story. So I really am grateful for that talk. I wanna urge everyone in the workshop and outside uh, to send your questions to the Q and A box. I have a couple myself that I'd like to start out with. First of all, uh, 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 Ryan, um, you know, in, in the period we're about to enter, this, this armistice period, um, is a period in which the Armenians, at least, had not just been murdered, deported, displaced, and forcibly, in many cases, hundreds of thousands of cases, uh, converted to Islam perhaps enslaved, married, orphaned, all of these things. But you could say that in a large sense, a whole society, a way of life, networks and all had been also destroyed. I years ago watched an incredible film called Image Before My Eyes, which was about the uh, Jewish community in Poland. And this movie never, as I remember, mentioned the Holocaust. It just showed what a rich, diverse, textured life Jews of Poland had between the wars. Mm. Organizations, political parties, members in the Polish parliament, etc. And we know as we're watching this, they're all going to disappear. And it seemed to me that Armenians were in a similar situation where they had actually members in parliament, a literature, a language, you know, out of Mutahayaden, Western Armenian, different from what's spoken in uh, the Armenian Republic today. Uh, all kinds of things. And they've been there for centuries with that society. And then, woof, they're gone. 
I, I would like you to speak about this in two ways, if you would. And, sure. and, and don't let me impose on you if you don't feel comfortable with it. One is what happens to a, a society when you eliminate one of the major constituents, vital constituents in that society. Armenians, along with Greeks and Jews and many Turks and Muslims as well, but very much so the Christian and Jewish population made up in the late Ottoman Empire what you call civil society. Right. right? The business community, all kinds of professionals, photographers, you know, dentists, whatever. And it's eliminated. And the, 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 the consequence of that is that in the Kemalist Republic, as they invent a new country and they invent a new nation, they have to do it from the top down by the state because they've eliminated civil society to a large degree. I wish you, I would love you to talk about that. And then I have one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Sure. I, I mean, I think one of the things that I've, you know, taken, pleasure is the wrong word because it is a terrible subject. One of the things I've found most fascinating is delving into resources that tell the stories of communities after the war. In particular, communities um, that were shaped really profoundly by the deportation and massacre of Armenians. And I've, where I've, I'm, you know, where I've really drawn the most um, from, you know, on this topic are in communities that are actually outside of historic Armenia, outside of Cilicia, outside of Eastern Anatolia, or even outside the capital, that you would, you would see communities where, as you describe it, the um, urban class of professionals or urban class of merchants, bankers, educators are overwhelmingly made up of Armenians, um, but intermixed with even larger numbers of Muslims, Muslims of various backgrounds, or perhaps even Greeks who suffer a very similar fate during the First World War. And <laughs> we have resources that tell really poignant stories about how these societies during a very, th there is a very brief window between the fall of 1918 till I'd say about the summer of 1919. You could maybe stretch this out a little bit into 1920. By 1920, things really begin to change of communities that actually try in some ways to put themselves back together again. And that there are issues such as trying to return properties to those who have survived the Armenian genocide or even elements of trying to rebuild something like civil government. Now, the problem ultimately is in lots of these places is that it's poisoned by this specter of foreign occupation. And so, you know, a place that is really near and dear to my heart, you know, um, which is sort of the Northwest of Anatolia, um, you know, we're talking about the shadow of British occupation or the shadow of French occupation potentially the shadow of Greek or, or the shadow of Greek occupation. And so this moment of potential rebuilding is short-circuited and highly becomes highly politicized. And you know, despite the fact that you do see in sources elements of those who are left behind during the course of the First World War, you know, those you know, Muslims who are not deported, Muslims who remain during the First World War, expressions of uh, of relief in having their these their former neighbors come home, expressions of guilt, expressions of envy, all of that is short circuited by 1920. And after that, the topic itself becomes so politicized that these people, that neighbors, even from a very provincial perspective, neighbors are no longer viewed as neighbors. They were viewed as representations of broader existential threats, threats that have to be done away with. Uh, that, you know, the issue of what happens to civil society is sort of abandoned. It, I mean, and this is, I think, something that is underappreciated within the literature, um, is that, you know, so much of what happens between 1914 and 1922 is self-sabotage. It's sort of se and our profound acts of self-destruction in eliminating, and this is not only on the part of neighbors, but it's on the part of governments, that neighbors... Uh, are and, and local officials 
find it more appropriate to eliminate these communities rather than attempt to, you know, um, you know, realize the fact that they are also, um, I'm sorry, my dog just jumped into the room and he's now running a muck. Okay, here, buddy, here, take him away. Okay. Thanks, pal. All right. Thank you. Sorry about that, everybody. Anyway, um, now the, I, you know, what happens is that they do this at the detriment of the local economy. They do it to the detriment of local society. We see between this period of time, uh, famine, the breakdown of something like supply chains um, occur precisely because, these, because people are removed. It actually leads to the injury of the local economy and the broader empire at a moment in which the empire is fighting for its life. And this would also include after 1918, in the midst of the so-called Turkish War of Independence. You know, when we look, sort of zoom out, and I know this is somewhat beyond the pur purview of 1922, um, you're right, Ron. I mean, you're having a, uh, you're then confronting a society that has to rebuild itself, but ends up being rebuilt from the top down. Uh, and in that absence of something like a top bottom-up process, um, not only is a lot lost, but a lot is forcibly erased and forcibly forgotten, um, both at sort of the national level, but even at the most local of levels. And you pay for that. If you, yeah. in fact, deny, as many of our questioners are doing, that there was a genocide or that there was all of this violence, that the state was built, what's called Kurtulus Savasha, the war of liberation, in fact, is a time of of ethnic cleansing and, and deportation and so forth. If you, if you forget about those events, and I'm not talking just about the genocide of 1915, 1916, but the events that occur um, in, in the period of, of the liberation war in Cilicia and other places. Um, you know, it seems to me that period and the period we're looking at is a key period that we have to both evaluate um, the level of violence that that occurred and displacement that occurred in founding of a nation. Yeah. And as Americans, we know that well. <laughs> How yeah. did we get this continent? We displaced and other peoples, right? Ethnically cleansed them. Some would say genocide. And other states in the world, uh, you know, have also done that. Israel is one example, and and there are probably many others in the world. And we don't know what the Chinese are planning ultimately, but they're engaged in similar events with the Uyghurs and Tibetans and so forth. So we've got a really interesting uh, problematic here, it seems to me, uh, that's occurring. Go ahead, we're about can to I inter Can I inject one quick thing is that I think, you know, originally my talk was going to be about this issue of narrative and how important it is uh, in sort of setting up the divide that we now see in academic terms, but even sort of broadly politically and culturally um, in the world today between, you know, sort of the way in which, you know, people see this period of time as a moment of tragedy for Armenians or betrayal for Armenians, but also this moment of both profound defeat, but also profound redemption for Turks. And on the latter point, you know, what is so I, I think um, important to understand is that the events of between 1918 and 1922 provide fodder for those who see Armenians as the true perpetrators. And that you can point to multiple episodes during this period of time, whether it's the Armenian collaboration with French authorities in Cilicia, um, and acts of violence towards Muslims in, you know, in southern, let's say, southern Turkey, um, violence committed by troops and paramilitaries raised by the Armenian state, not only within the borders of the Armenian state, but outside of it too, you know, there, you know, for example, the uh, destruction of Erzurum in 1918, all of these, you know, are used as important points to validate the denial of the Armenian genocide and sort of to turn it on its head and say, you know, the world's got it wrong. You know, the ones who are truly the, you know, the, you know, the victims um, is Turkey and its Turks. And, and one thing that, you know, I've tried to do in my work um, is to try, is try to sort of not only sort of, for, you know, kind of emphasize the fallacy of that thinking, 
but the degree to which the the idea itself that the charge itself is important to the formation of of Turkey and the idea of Turkishness. Nicely done. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let me ask you one more question, and then I, I will go to, to again some of the outside questions. Um, so this period again, 1918 to 1923, uh, and you hinted at this, and I'm thinking of you know Eric Zucker's work. It's always about continuities. Um, how would you characterize? Almost thinking like like a political scientist or a historical sociologist. Is is uh, in, in our armistice period? Are we still talking about an empire? There's still a dynasty. A lot of the rhetoric, even by Kemal, is is seems to have an imperial, a broader than than simply national ethno-national sense. Is it is it moving toward nation state? It's certainly going to end up there, right? Uh, so I, I'd love you to sort of see how you would, in some synthetic way characterize that 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 period and then i'll go to the questions that are that are coming in i i um i mean i'll, I'll try to play the role of a social scientist on tv i, I i'm not going to do a very good job though <laughs> uh i mean assuming from the perspective of those who talk about this very issue in the context of 1918 1919 1920 and thereafter it's clear that they themselves, you know, that that commentators are themselves not entirely sure what they're talking about when they're talking about specifically the state. Now, they all agree that there is this state, and it's a state that, you know, has formerly its capital in Istanbul, and that at the top of the state is a sultan caliph. However, whether it's an empire, whether it's in fact a Turkish state or a Muslim state is still something of, you know, a, you know, an open question during these immediate years. And it's something that people are clearly working themselves through and debating. And I, what I would say <coughs> is that what's critical to understand during this period of time, one really gets this sense when you read the newspapers of this period of time, um, the Ottoman language newspapers of this period of time, um, or even read the recollections of those who lived, you know, of let's say officers and officials during this period of time, they read the international news section. Now, a lot of us historians who write about this period, when you open up a newspaper, you, you immediately turn to the local news as opposed to the international news. But from their perspective, they're reading the international news. And what are they reading about? They're reading about the Soviet Union. They're reading about the, about the establishment of these new republics in Eastern Europe. They're reading about the movements, the beginning of independence movements in India, in North Africa. They're reading about affairs in Mexico, in Latin America. They're beginning to understand, you know, they're, they're understanding the debate that's taking place in Paris around the idea of self-determination and around the idea of national so sovereignty grounded in this idea of some kind of national consensus built around population, built around self-definition, all those sorts of things. And so in reading all of that, in, in sort of in absorbing all of that, you have you know, a, a kind of cacophony of voices that on the one hand, during the early stages of this period of time are talking about the endurance of an Ottoman state. And they, you don't see the rephrasing of Ottoman empire as much as Ottoman state. Um, but gradually references to Ottoman begin to fade, become less consistent and give way more consistently to the notion of it being of, of a place called Turkey or a Turkish state. Now where the quandary comes though, is that even before 1918, commentators talked about a Turkish state, they talked about a place called Turkey, they talked about a, a people called Turks, but this was used synonymously with the Ottoman Empire. So it raises the question of, are they still talking about it in this kind of colloquial way that either they're, the two are synonymous with one another, or are they talking about something very specific, the rise of a nation state? And I would say that that becomes you know, a much more definite concept post 1920, 1921. By then, the notion of the state being Ottoman in character, let alone an empire, gives way to increasingly the talk of a, of a 
of a nation state, or as Mustafa Kemal would often talk about, is a populist state, and that representing a populist consensus. Thank you. Yes. So we have a couple of questions from members of the of the of the workshop itself from panelists, and the first one I have is from Daniel Joseph MacArthur, and he writes that um, that he'd like to ask, uh, where do we fit in this large expansion of civil society? new enterprise, new political connections, such as multinational trade unions that we see in evidence of already in the armistice period in Istanbul, uh, under the uh, stimulation in a way of the allied presence and also the arrival of refugees from Russia, from the Balkans, from Anatolia. So right. there's, there's a, 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 there is a generation of civil society uh, Daniel Joseph is 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 uh, implying uh, already in the armistice period. Yeah, I mean, I think Istanbul, and the way I see it within the broader context of writing about this period, is its own universe. Precisely because it is the seat of the Ottoman Empire, it remains profoundly diverse through this period of time. A, diver a diversity that reflects its pre-war culture, pre-war society. It reflects international affairs, as you allude to, specifically the arrival of, of refugees from Russia um, during this period of time. Its interconnectedness to the broader allied effort uh, against the Soviet Union during the, the, the Russian Civil War. Um, and then also these sort of trappings of urban political culture, as you reference sort of trade unions and civil society organizations, particularly let's say civil society organizations that are formed by um, smaller ethnic groups or by women um, that are representative of a really rich tapestry of political culture. I think it's, I, I personally have trouble sort of trying to fit, you know, talk about Istanbul within the broader context of this period because it is so dynamic and in many ways so unreflective of what's happening in really broad swaths of territory. And so this is a kind of, as a personal side of this, um, what do you focus on? What is the, what's the, you know, what is most representative of this period of time? And I think that you, you do have to balance both, but you also have to recognize that Istanbul, you know, remains this place that really is the embodiment of an Ottoman culture that is beginning to die out in large parts of the other part of the of the empire. And that even post-1923, it still represents that. You know, and you know, we we know we have a very good idea that post-1923, people who lived in Istanbul really didn't like the idea of the republic. They they've lost so much with the establishment of the republic. And the enmity of that loss endures for many years. Um, so it's a challenge of trying to balance it, but it's a great point. And it is sort of, it, it, it emphasizes the real sort of the, the trickiness of trying to write a period about a period that is so dense and so complex. Oh, that's so interesting. And in fact, um, Daniel Joseph is, it mentions in at the end of his question that this the, looking at it this way uh, it goes against the, tyrannical narrative of simply tragedy and destruction. And I'm thinking of Charles King's book, you know, Midnight at the Para Palace, where, they, where we're going to explode in the 20s in Istanbul in a period of cultural, uh, um, uh, you know, effluence as well as a kind of decadence. So, okay, um, Ari, our, one of our organizers, uh, the principal organizer has the following question. First of all, he wants to thank you, Ryan for accepting the invitation to deliver the keynote address and for this fascinating lecture today. His question is about the rhetoric of the Turkish national movement. We know that the Turkish national movement led by Mustafa Kemal did not employ mainly a Turkish nationalist rhetoric just to convince other Muslim populations such as Kurds, Circassians, Laz, Balkan Muslims to join the struggle. However, this rhetoric changed during the first year of the Turkish Republic. Could you elaborate on that? Right. I mean, I think when you look at nationalist rhetoric, the, 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 the rhetoric of the national movement, um, we have to, first of all, uh, you know, understand that there, there are many voices. And in some ways, there are certain tensions within it. 
you know, Mustafa Kemal has the biggest megaphone of all of these voices. And with, you know, Mustafa Kemal himself, you know, intones lots of different, um, uh, you know, sort of ideologies or kind of national issue, you know, kind of approaches towards national questions. Um, at, at the same time, we, 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 see, we see hints of communism in, in his rhetoric. We see hints of, uh, you know, certainly sort of invoking uh, the, the specter of a kind of pan-Islamic, of, of this being part of a broader pan-Islamic movement. Uh, there are Turkist elements of it too. And depending on the topic and depending on the issue, uh, you know, and, or, and also the year, there is, there are shifts, okay? Uh, I can't say that I have an encyclopedic knowledge of all of Mustafa Kemal's speeches, although I'm sure there are at least some out in the wider universe of, of viewers of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this workshop or just sort of in the world at large who do. And, and you see it certainly in, in Shukur Hariolo's work, work on the, as in his intellectual biography of Ataturk, that there are these ideological issues, but you know, there are, are kind of cross currents in his own talk in his own approach towards ideology um but there are other you know sort of people who are helping to build the rhetoric of this period of time who i think we have to pay attention to um and they don't necessarily get the kind of uh attention because um they are lesser figures um or they're not necessarily even formally involved with the um with the national movement. I'm thinking of editors, for example. Uh, editors like, you know, people who write for Ikhdam or people who write for Tasviri uh, Efkari, um, uh, these sort of major Istanbul newspapers who are not formally nationalists. They're not part of the movement, but who also very similarly draw upon, you know, these ideas you know, on various ideas and kind of, and make it into an amalgamation. Now, I mean, I, I see you're asking about sort of the issue of, you know, of the invocation of Islam as an important point in, in sort of arousing non-Turkish Muslims. Um, I think the one thing I would come away with is that for large numbers of citizens, um, the basic concept of belonging, the kind of core point in which one thinks of themselves as belonging to something like an Ottoman community is Islam. So, you know, the, the, and this is something that is reverberates through the press, it reverberates through what we know of the kind of rallying efforts we see in provincial communities. So I, I but it's also quite clear that this is something that is fraught by a that the the people who are often using this are are considered to be rebels by the sultan they are people who are associated with the young turk government who were broadly you know denounced and reviled throughout society and also seen as bad muslims in very various ways there's sort of rife amount of talk about the young turks being freemasons and atheists and jews and so therefore kind of false muslims and also for the fact that, you know, Muslims themselves were the victims of oppression by the government. I, you know, I've written obviously a lot about this, you know, with respect to Circassians and to Albanians, but as well as obviously Kurds as well. So there, you know, there were limits to which this rhetoric had any appeal. And so, I, and I think this is one of the reasons why we also see a kind of diversity of different um, kinds of tropes in nationalist rhetoric. Thank you, Ryan. So we have time for one more question, but before I get to it, I just want to mention, Ryan, you might not have looked at the questions and answers, but you, and you didn't really talk about the genocide. This wasn't your topic, but uh, there's a strange thing that occurred. And that is usually in the Armenian studies program, and we've had lectures on every possible topic. Genocide has certainly been one of them, denialism, whatever. Uh, but we have had very, we've been largely free from the kind of rhetoric and the kinds of accusations that your lecture, for some reason, you, I think you're totally innocent, have generated. Yeah. Uh, the one that's most succinctly argues this, there are several that deny genocide. Okay, that's not your topic. You people are a bunch of racists, that's all, with no real name, just a moniker. So, you know, I, it's very interesting that even a topic that doesn't focus on the most difficult, controversial, dangerous, 
uh, fraught uh, aspects of Armenian history would also bring these things up. But there is also a very good question. And as a Russianist, as a person who does Soviet history primarily, I, I really like. And this, this question asks, do you think it would make any sense and help us to understand what happened to describe this period of time as one of civil war that was very similar to say what happened almost simultaneously in post-revolutionary Russia? Yes. I mean, I really briefly, in some ways, this is the, the it's this thinking that inspired the, my first book on this subject is that, you know, there so much of the of Anatolia is wrapped by general civil violence um, between the the national movement and local inhabitants. I've documented in the cases of northwestern Anatolia, but you see it in regions like such as Konya. You see it obviously in Dersim during this period of time. There is an era of civil war, and I think like the Russian Civil War, it elicited from people lots of different views about what they think their future should be like. And it reflects the broader true diversity of, of opinion and identity in, the re, in, in what you know, we think of as today as a, as a Turkish state. Um, and it also just to kind of go back to what we were really talking about, it does give you evidence of a civil society, you know, a civil society that really hadn't been, you know, given an opportunity to express itself. But in this really kind of, again, this really intense period of politics, it, we definitely, we definitely get it. You know, we definitely get a, a broader uh, array of, of attention. And, and I think it, this is, I think, very thankfully, a product of the broader international attention that this, that the Ottoman Empire got during this period of time. We have missionaries and, intelligence officials and military officers and diplomats on the ground documenting this in real time. And, and this is why we know we, we know more about this period than we know about other periods. It's almost a law of revolution that there'll be foreign intervention. If you think of 1791, 92, if you think of uh, 1918 to 1920 in Russia, and you think of the, the period of the liberation war in Turkey as well. So civils, Civil war sounds to me like a really apt me metaphor. You put it so beautifully. And then foreign intervention. You know, there are lots of people who were claiming pieces of territory, the Greeks certainly. And in such a war, no war is as devastating as a civil war. It's fra fratricidal. And the atrocities on many sides are part of that story. And we're gonna investigate many of these things as we go on. Uh, Ryan, let me give you a last chance to, to sum up if you like. Uh, and then we'll, we'll close down for half an hour from around 12.30 to 1, and then come back with our first panel. Ryan. Okay. Uh, I, I know I'll ask, was asking a question too, I, and I'll, I'll try to kind of end on this, asking about, you know, the sort of the transnational aspect of, of this period of time, and specifically Mustafa Kamal's place in it. Now, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I, I know you've, you've done really great work on this Alp, uh, Alp and, and, I, and you can speak to this and, and much more persuasively than I can. But I think the, what is so interesting and I think really underappreciated is that from the perspective of people who aspired for, you know, to independence, especially from imperial rule, um, there was, uh, a lot of admiration, obviously for most, not simply Mustafa Kemal, but for what was seen as the resistance of uh, of the Tur of Turks of Muslims to foreign intervention during this period of time. And the, I mean, the, if the rhetoric focuses on on anything, it's not simply Mustafa Kemal. It's obviously you know, the caliph, the sultan caliph as a kind of, you know, avatar for this broader question of Ottoman sovereignty and the struggle for Ottoman sovereignty. And I think that, you know, this is, you know, a way I, you know, in particular for broader audiences to tru truly appreciate the substance of this, uh, of this period. The flip side of this, I would add though, 
and, and this is more specifically the case of Armenians, what's quite interesting during this period of time and, and genuinely tragic is that the period, the period genuinely began with, as one defined by international sympathy for Armenians. And by 1920, that you know, sympathy begins to fade and interest begins to dull. And that what overtakes it in many ways is the broader question of resolving the political issues of borders, citizenship, uh, and, and, and for the role of foreign actors in the region. And so Armenians are, are lost within that um, and compensated rather poorly as a result of it, you know, that there, there is briefly an Armenian state, but it's one that's amalgamated into the Soviet Union. Uh, refugees are, you know, are cared for, many are accepted abroad in various places, uh, but their losses materially and so on are, are basically, uh, or are, are overlooked or sort of, or, 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 or denied to them. So I think it, it cuts, you know, the, when we think about this as a transnational moment of history, it reflects, uh, we can sort of, we can lean, you know, into one direction or other. This again is a kind of moment of, of heroism, which I think is again, most favored by the Turkish state, by this other broader sort of trope, which I think is, it's not wrong, is that of betrayal. And that of, uh, of sort of an unredeemed, the sense of, uh, uh, of unredeemed loss as a result of this, you know, of the great war and of the promises that began the armistice. Thank you, Ryan. That's a wonderful way to end because the conference is really about what you're calling this transnational moment. Uh, this is a moment in which the idea of national self-determination, both in the Wilsonian form and the Leninist form, is part of the larger discourses of politics that it's arising. And the Kemalist movement is, is in one, one effect of that uh, liberation and national self-determination. Of course, Armenians who have been largely destroyed and displaced from uh, what they consider their historic homeland don't have as resonant a claim on uh, where they had been as uh, now the Muslims do. So in that, with that, and it's now 1230, Let's thank Ryan. We can't do it physically, but we can kind of clap if we like. Thank uh, you, everybody. And, and we'll, we'll uh, suspend our meetings until one o'clock. See you all in about half an hour. See you. Thank you, everyone.